<laughs> he evolved from a cocoon to a butterfly. You can see it in the map. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You know, disrupt play. Um, so when we're pressing teams high up, he likes to be in that more advanced role. And with the ball, you know, I've been playing in a completely different position. I've been playing in a pocket. Um, he's been telling me about arriving in the box, you know, body orientation, turning in pockets. You know, it's been complete. Oh my gosh, There's, that's a lot to unpack right now. I Look at this. So we see that Kai Havertz is ready. You see that bicycle kick? Kai Havertz is ready, baby. He's ready for this match. Peter alluded to there. Struggled at the start of his new life at Arsenal. Got better in the middle nine. You can see in his last nine, four open play goals. The XG, very different as well compared to 0.67 in the first nine matches of the campaign. Compared People been saying that oh City ain't lost since 2020 at their home. I'm telling you, we didn't have Kai Havertz when we played there when we lost 4 1. We did not have, we had Jesus up top. We had Jesus up top. We didn't have William Silva. These are two of the most important players for us this season. Try to barge into Silva. You see, a guy on the floor like this is twist up his hands all over. His neck is crook. He's looking like something from a scary movie. He got run over by William Silva. He crashed in William Silva and it was third. It was worse off for it, right? So William Silva ended his career in that match. There's the stories that came out. The ghost of of what was it? The ghost of Manchester. <laughs> So there's a big match brewing on the weekend. The biggest match of the season, no doubt, between Man City and the Gunners. And for me, this is going to be a very, very exciting match. Arsenal's been playing so well. Every single player in the Arsenal team has been on fire. They have been churning. They have been fighting. They have been digging in. So everyone's on form. But when it comes down to City now, City, we see, they're not all on form. However, with City, you can never know what you're going to get on the day because they can just flick it. They can just flick a finger and then everything turns back on. So we can't really take that for granted. But we're going to take a look into some clips today and we're going to evaluate what people have been saying about this match coming up because this is more, uh, Arsenal's most important match of the season. It's City's most important match of the season. And every match after this is going to be our most important match of the season um, till the end of the season. So right now, Arsenal is in joint top with Liverpool at 64 points while City is at 63. So a goal difference look like this. We scored five more than Liverpool and seven more than City. When it comes down to conceded, we conceded the least amount of goal in the league um, at 24, um, Liverpool at 26, and then City at 28. So, so overall, we're the better team. We're scoring the more, most, we're conceding the less, and we're on top of the league, baby. So that shows you that we are on peak form individually and collectively as a team. Managers on peak form, managers doing certain tweaking and certain things, and it's working. So even the manager is on form. Even the set-piece coach is on form. Everyone at Arsenal is on form. Isn't it? Even the fans are on form. Even the fans are on for, right? So, big up to all you gooners out there. I know you're happy. I know you're loving it. Some are nervous. Some are excited for the match against City. I'm one of these ones that are very excited. Can't wait until Sunday. So, the last time we played against City, we won 1-0. Martin in the last minute goal. And we, this is how we set up. This is our formation um, for us and for City. Now, there's a few narratives out there when it comes down to us playing against City, especially of recent. Because some people are saying, listen, City hasn't lost since 2020 at their own ground, right? So the, 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 the narratives is that City won't lose at, at, at the Etihad. They won't lose. And we see that we beat City 1-0. But as I said with Martin, but I said that was at the Emirates. It wasn't at, at, at the Etihad. So to play at the Etihad right now, last season, City beat us 4-1. But listen, take that with a pinch of salt. Look at our lineup that we played against City that we lost 4-1. So first of all, for City, we noticed that Godigan is, is gone. So they're weaker than what they were last season in terms of this format, in terms of this setup, their team. So they're weaker. Even though they got um, um, Alvarez, they're still weaker. Because for, for me, Godigan was a very important player for them last season. Um, and they lost him. Now, when it comes down to us, Luke was in <laughs> our centre of defence. And coincidentally, he's got, he, he got the goal. Rob only got the goal, right? And he was in our centre back last season. No wonder why we lost four one. I remember some dumb pullbacks that he done, but man, 
We had Jacker in the team also. Now, I'm not saying that Jacker is a downgrade to, 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 to Rice, but Rice is a better player overall. At the beginning of, of the season, I would say that yes, Partey was better than Rice. But I knew that Rice would work his way into the team. And he's been doing that for basically since the first 10 match. After the first 10 match of the season, I believe that Rice looked like second to none in this league. It looks, it fits seamlessly into the team. And it took him a bit of time to get accustomed to the players, to the style of the play. And I'm going to show you so what he said about Arteta, what he had to change and why it took him so long to change certain things. Stay tuned to the end of the video. I'm going to show you some clips on what he said about Arteta and how he found it to basically to be adapted his game. So, with Xhaka's gone, we got Rice and Rob Holding's not in the team. So, you wonder why we lost 4-1? Now, I'm telling everyone, this is going to be a totally different match. Now, we can go to the Etihad and rip up that what they have right now. They've got, they're trying to build a fortress there. So, they're trying to make the Etihad a fortress. And we're going there to, to hopefully to spoil their plans. We're going there to rip up this record that they have right now. We're going to destroy it. That's our plan. That's our Tetris plan. And that's the plan of the team. Man, I'm excited. So, so once again, there's a few narratives and, and agendas being turned right now. And it's, it's a lot of mind games. Arteta's been playing mind games and Pepper's been playing mind games. So <laughs> I know they know each other. So they'll be playing mind games against each other because Saka pulled out the England team. Ben White didn't go to the England team. Gabo J didn't go. Magalhães didn't go. Um, Timber didn't go because once again he was coming back to fitness. Tamiyasu didn't go. Um, Party didn't go. There were so much players in the Arsenal squad that didn't go international duty. And people have been saying this and been saying that. However, it's, it's both sides. Take a look at this. So Akanje is a doubt. Kawoko is a doubt. De Bruyne is a doubt. Edison is a doubt. Stones is a doubt. Nunes. Is, now I understand Nunes because he broke his finger. But everyone else, I feel like they're going to be up and going for Sunday. Right? And for us, Timber is out. But we know that Timber is back in. He's just not in competitive form right now. Martin is a doubt. And Saka is a doubt. Both are playing my game. Right? Now, let's see on Sunday. I know every one of these, apart from Nunes and apart from Timber, might not, uh, these are the only two that might not play in this match. But everyone else will play. I'm, I'm, trust me. Everyone will play. It's just the mind game everyone is playing um, to for other managers to tweak their tactics to match what they think might come and give them more things to think about, give them more things to plan for. And when you get a lot, when you try to give someone more things to plan for, it's going to take their mind of what they was doing in the first place. It's like a, it's like a 5D chess mind game they're playing right now. And I love it. I love it. The last time we played against Pep, um, if you watch that video, um, it's, it was about a mind game and Arteta won that mind game. Uh, it was a game of chess. It wasn't exciting. It was kind of a boring. It was kind of measured. But it was a chess game. And it was absolutely magnificent. I loved it. Now, I believe this one might be a bit a bit exciting. I believe this one because everyone is going to be... Because Pepper's been saying that, listen, Arsenal is very fast out the blocks. And they can, they can finish the game off with, 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 within 20 minutes. So Pep is going to go out there trying not... For Arsenal to concede um, two things, two things. He might go out there, try to get Arsenal not to concede within them 25 to 30 minutes, or he tried to outscore Arsenal within 25 to 30 minutes. So let's see with Pep's game plan, but it's going to be an exciting one. Uh, but Arsenal withdrawing their three Brazilian Gabriels, didn't they? You mentioned Saka, you got Ben White rejecting a call up. Um, is there a sense that they are being protected rather than? Major doubts. Let's put it that way. Well, I think people will always be slightly suspicious in these circumstances, won't they? But um, no, I think there's no reason to think that they haven't got injury now. So. First of all, this guy is very optimistic. I don't know if he's an Arsenal fan, but he's very optimistic because even I don't believe that. Gabriel, and, uh, for Brazil, he was he was. You know, the, the Brazil manager talked about him having this injury problem. Obviously, Southgate acknowledged that Saka reported to the England camp with uh, with an existing problem. I see a little smirk there. I don't know if you call that, but I saw a little smirk okay, there. There are issues there that need to be, um, need to be looked at and, and, and probably it was in the best interest of England and Brazil in, in Gabriel's case, as well as Arsenal to, to give those players a rest and ensure they didn't exacerbate the issues. So, um, of course, there's always... A that one is true though. You don't want to be playing a player if he's injured or if he has a little niggling concern. You don't want to play him, especially in friendlies. So that is true, but I still don't agree with the fact that they they were injured, right? I, I still think it's a uh, mind game. There are always question marks about, about these things before big games like this, but um, it does seem there are genuine injury concerns on both sides. Now, a lot of fans have been saying that, listen, 
blaming Arsenal, as I said before about this. But take a look at what this guy said. He said, Rice played both England game. Walker and Stone limp off in the first half of both, right? Odegaard played both of Norway's whilst Haaland pulled out of both, right? Trussell played for Belgium whilst De Bruyne pulled out of both. Blah, 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 blah. So transparent, Arsenal. So this is it that everyone's just keeping an eye on Arsenal, but City done the same thing. It's just that City did it. <laughs> um, Arteta did a way for Saka to play the first match to pull him out. Right, but well, listen, we can go back and forth, back and forth with the same thing. It's just that both managers are trying to protect their players and they're playing my games. So there's nothing more to it, right? So now we're going to take a look on uh, Kai Havertz because you see that Kai Havertz has been one of our most important players in recent matches. He's been a key factor in the way how we've been playing and how we've been attacking and the different transition up front. So we're going to take a look into the, some stats on Kai Havertz and we're going to hear what people have to say about Kai Havertz because I believe that he's going to be very important in this match. It's going to be a, fr a show off, a showdown between Kai Havertz and Ruben, Ruben Diaz. And if Stones is out, it's definitely Ruben Diaz between Kai Havertz and Ruben Diaz or possibly Akanji. We'll see how it goes because Akanji might play right back. I don't know what Pep is going to do, but I know that um, more likely than not, it's going to be between Kai Havertz and Ruben Diaz. So let's just say what they have to say. Let's take a look at some of the stats in the situation when you compare him to previous campaigns. Uh, this is obviously the last four seasons. And already you can see when it comes to open play goals, he's on six this season compared to the seven in 21-22, which is his best, the open play. Now let's take a look at some of those stats. So 21, 20, 2021 season, you can see that it's a progression, right? Apart from the 21-22 season, is his best season looks like for Chelsea because he's got um, better open play goal than even the following year. He got better open play XG and he's got a better big chance um, percentage. So 2021 season, 21-22 um, season is his best season for Chelsea. But now when you take a look at Arsenal now, Bear in mind the season is not finished. He's still got 10 games to go in the, in the Premier League and, and matches to go also in the Champions League. So the season is not done and I know he's going to score more goals in the season. So he's going to outdo his best season for Chelsea, which is the 21-22 season. So this is what I've been telling people that we need to get the player for Chelsea. I said it to James. I keep telling James that, listen, you're focusing on uh, um, Kai Havertz that played for Chelsea. We didn't get the Kai Havertz that played. Well, we got him, but we're transforming him into the Kai Havertz that was playing for Bayern Leverkusen. That's the Kai Havertz we're changing him into. So look at this now. Open play goes 6. Um, XG, open play XG, 5.16. Uh, 5.61, so that needs a bit of tweaking. When you compare his first season for Chelsea and his first season for us, obviously that's an upgrade. Um... No, XG difference, it's a plus. It's not a minus. The three, the three season with Chelsea, it's been a minus. With us, it's a plus. And then the big chance created, it's a 47% in the 40s. The highest it's ever been in his best season for Chelsea is 33. So you see, it's a different kind of habits. Totally different player. So we need to stop judging him on how he's been, he was playing for Chelsea and start judging him by his stance and which he played for Bayern Leverkusen. That's the kind of habits we see now. as well. Uh, slightly, slightly different, different at the moment, moment perhaps, perhaps because, because he's playing in a slightly different role you can see the xg difference uh, and significantly the big chances the percentage is there you can see very different for arsenal 47 percent this is how he compares in terms of this season in the first nine games the middle nine games and the last nine games okay once again let's take a look at that you can see the progression just like when he started for chelsea comparing to where he's from us there's a massive day and light different day and night difference he's improved a lot um especially when it comes down to his first season for chelsea and his first season for arsenal now it's the same if you look at his first nine games the so first nine game for us zero open play goals um xg 0.67 big chances two only two big chance uh big chances chances created seven um Possession one in final third four. So that's why I keep saying that. Listen, even when he's not confident, Arteta loves him because he's, he's win, he wins back position and high up the pitch. He's a, a grafter. He's a good dual winner. He's the best dual winner in our team. It's Kahavas, then Jesus as our best dual winners. So this is what Arteta loves. And when everyone is cussing that he's not scoring, I keep saying, stop judging him as a striker right now. He's not a striker. He's a midfielder that wins the ball high at the pitch. That's what Arteta loves. That's why Arteta kept playing him when everyone was cussing him. Aerial Jules, he won 13 even though he was having a poor, poor, poor confidence. Now, 
Middle night team game not now middle nine games that you can see the confidence is good. He's, he's a confident player. If you listen to Georgina's last interview, you heard Georgina said, you see, when Cavs get confidence, he's gonna you're gonna see a different, you're gonna see how good he is. He's a very, very special player, but he needs confidence to play. And I'll take to recognize that. Now we see open play goals three, um, open play XG two, uh, big chances six, uh, chances created eight. So that's an improvement. Uh Possession one in final third, eight, double. Um, Aero Jews one increased the well. So everything increased in the middle nine games. When it comes down to um, the last nine games now, four goals scored. Um, um, open play XG, six, um, 3.68. Big chances, seven. Um, chances created, 13. Um, um, possession one in final third, 10, 10 times. Aero Juice won 25. 25 Aero Juice, so you can see. It's not just the fact that Kyle Havertz is getting more confident. Another thing I've been noticing is the David Raya starting to hit him more cleanly. It's just like the David Raya and Ivan Tony link up. David Raya started to hit him cleanly and his add-ons are even better. Kyle Havertz and add-on are improving because the players are around him. Not under, they're starting to gel together. They're starting to understand each other, where each other might make runs. So I love to see. It's a massive improvement. You can see the difference. Kyle Havertz and the play goals. Like Peter alluded to there, struggled at the start of his new life at Arsenal. Got better in the middle nine. You can see in his last nine, four open play goals. The XG very different as well compared to 0.67 in the first nine matches of the campaign compared to 3.68 now the big chances very different as well you can see the trajectory here Kai Havertz is finally fulfilling his potential he looks like he's comfortable at Arsenal at the moment possession one in the final third again that's improved from four to eight to ten so he's on the front foot he's pressing high winning the ball uh, and you can see again the aerial duels one very different 13 20 and 25 so all of that there is really painting a so i'm telling you people have been saying that oh city had lost since 2020 at their own i'm telling you we didn't have kai Havertz when we played there when we lost 4-1 we did not have we had jesus up top we had jesus up top we didn't have william Silva. these are two of the most important players for us this season why we're scoring so much goals and why we're conceding so many less so so um, and it's not the fact that kai Havertz is scoring a lot of goals it's the way he plays he scores a few goals that his link up play the way he runs creates space for other players. Remember that goal that um, that uh, Martinelli scored. Who he lay off? Who was the assister? It was uh, Tamiyasu added it to Kai Havertz. Kai Havertz lay off to Martinelli. Goal. So I'm telling you, we didn't have Kai Havertz when we played at City last Picture season. That this man is in just oh, saying. He's enjoying his football, and Mikel Arteta is getting the very best out of him. Arsenal fans will be hoping he carries on his recent form as well. It's five goals into his last eight games for club and country. One of those goals was against France, no less, at the weekend. Favourite. Now I saw a record that says that if he scores against City, he's going to be on the list to be in the uh, a player that scored um, the five consecutive five goals in, cons in consecutive matches, and the top is Henri on top with seven. Um, goals in, in as much consecutive matches. We see Saka's on the list as well. For the Euros. There you go, exactly, see. I mean, what do we think is behind this runner form? We all did think he was maybe going to step in the shoes of Granit Xhaka, playing that number eight, became a bit of a false nine. He's become real the focal point of the attack, hasn't he, Sam? And I said it, now listen, never doubt Arteta. Arteta knows what he's doing. Now, I thought he came in to play striker. Then Arteta put him in midfield. I'm saying, okay, Arteta has got him in to play midfield to play a Xhaka role, just like what she said. He's more attacking minded, um, so he will be able to get up the pitch more. And I, 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 hundred percent believe that's why Arteta got him. But Arteta started, and after that, I start to realize that he's a utility player because the Germany play him at left back, and he scored and did play good as well. And he said he doesn't care where he plays as long as he's on the pitch. So I realized he's kind of a utility player. But now he's starting to nail down a place in the striking position. He's starting to flourish in striking position. And I, if you watch my previous videos when we were scoring any goals, all I kept saying that I need a tall striker that we can have a plan B option because sometimes we don't have a plan B. We don't have a player that can shoot outside the box. Well, we still don't have it in Kai Havertz. We haven't got a player that could do a nice little header 
in the last minute to give us um, the winning goal. That is Kai Havertz. He's done that two times already this season. So this is what I'm saying. I've been wanting a player that can shoot from outside the box, a striker, and can do a um, header that's tall as well, that um, that Roy could aim for, that can kind of flick on onto other players. And Kai Havertz has that. So can I I'm telling you, whatever striker we get in the summer, I don't care who it is, Kai Havertz is going to give them a good run for their money because he's going to be um, getting better and better. And he's only 24, 25, uh, I believe, um, this end of the season. He's only 24, 25. So he's only going to get better and better. Yeah, I, I think, think so. so. I, I think, think you can, can see, see from those stats there, the, the fact that he's playing as a number nine, as a centre forward, he's getting more chances, he's getting higher XG, he's winning more aerial duels, he's in more dangerous areas in the middle of the pitch and I think that that's been crucial finding that balance getting the likes of Jorginho who he played with at Chelsea as well so that might be a factor as well into that is a factor I've showed you if you watch my previous video of the link up between Jorginho and Havertz the little dink over the top that's a Chelsea move they ran from Chelsea I've showed a clip on it as well um, and it's similar it's reminiscent of Song and Van Persie the little dink over the top so they're bringing back and it's interesting enough this uh, Thomas Tucker says that Kai Havertz played a bit like Berbatov and um, Dennis Bergkamp and Van Persie and it's a similar ball when um, Song dink it over the top Van Persie always have that uh, one hit strike or getting um, through a goal and scoring and we see Georgina is doing the same thing here hopefully um, Partey can do the same thing when it comes in the team because I've seen when Partey come into the last match with uh, um, Kai Havertz he done a few ball over the top some to Martinelli two to Saka and I think at least two or three to Havertz so Partey is on that track as well so as well with Declan Rice sort of playing a little bit further forward looking to move behind the runs but yeah, it feels like he's the number nine now, and that's especially encouraging given you know, they've got Gabriel Jesus and Leandro Trossard there, who have both had good spells, and Havertz is currently keeping both of them out of the team. Let's talk about one of the key clashes this weekend, Ruben Diaz against Kai Havertz. Now, in my personal opinion, Ruben Diaz has taken a slight drop off in performance level versus last year. Uh, you've seen his aerial dual win rate fall from about 61% to 49%. His tackle success rate is still very solid, but it feels like Nathan Ake potentially the only City defender that's really kept their level at the same from last year. Yes, I said it. I said it. Nathan Ake is the one to be wary about. And it says that he's injured. But Akanji, I still believe Akanji is very good as well. Nathan Ake and Akanji is the two defenders we need to worry about with Kai Havertz, right? Um, Akanji sometimes plays right back. So he's, he's going to be a trouble if he plays right back for Martinelli. But a left back now. Kyle Walker, I believe Kyle Walker will be back. So if Kyle Walker is, will, is back, I believe it's going to be um, Akanji and Stones. If Stones is fit, if Stones is not fit, it's going to be Akanji and Ruben Diaz. And that could be a very, very good partnership. Now, on the left back side now, that's where the interesting thing is. Because then Ake might come on it. Because you know, you remember last season, Ake dealt with Saka. Ake, Ake dealt with him nicely. So potentially, that's going to be a that's going to be a very, very good um, lineup between uh, Ake and Saka or Akanji and Saka. That's going to be interesting to see who plays on that left hand side because I know Pep is going to be planning for Saka and I know that Arteta is going to be countering uh, when Pep planned for Saka what he's going to do after with Odegaard being that link up player with, with uh, 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 White being that those three triangles that we always create on that side. I know Arteta is pre planning what Pep is going to do and how to overreact or react to what Pep is doing. I love these bad games. These managers play these days is absolutely Ruben Diaz, brilliant. loads of experience now. But he's coming up against a man in great form in Kai Havertz. He's got four goals and two assists in his last six games for Arsenal. He scored during the international break against France, uh, linking up really well with Jamal Musiala and Florian Verts there. So he comes into this game full of confidence. Yes, so Havertz have been increasing his link-up player. Just like what they said, Musiala and Wirtz, he's been increasing his link-up player, which is good for us. I'm happy he didn't get injured, and I'm happy he's practicing those link-up plays because we see the same thing with Odegaard. Odegaard is practicing with Oscar Bob. The same way he plays with Saka, he's been maintaining that in international duty. And that, I love to see that because in, that, in those videos I said that, listen, I want him to have, I want Odegaard to have someone that he can remind of Saka in that national team and vice versa with Kai Havertz. 
and all our players, our attacking players, our midfielders and defensive players, I wish they play with an international duty with similar players that we've got at the club because then they can develop more their understanding of different positions, their understanding of, of each other because if they play with similar players, it's easy to transfer to, to when they come back to the club. So that's something I really love that. Odegaard has Oscar Bob Kai Havertz as technical players around him, uh, like Wirtz and Musiala that plays similar to Saka and Odegaard. Yeah, for sure. And I think Havertz as well has a good record against Man City in, in recent times, at least. He obviously scored the winner in the Champions League final for Chelsea against them. And this season, he did well in the Community Shield as that central striker. As Arsenal won on penalties, he also came off the bench and set up the Martinelli winner at the Emirates Stadium. He does give them that physical sort of ability up Physical. front, you know, that outlet yeah, that they maybe yeah, don't yeah. have otherwise. He can win headers, exactly. he can win duels, exactly. he can bring others into play, he can run in behind as well. So I think Diaz is the man they will look to, Man City, to stop him. You know, he's there. I don't think, I, I think it's partial Diaz. And it's partially a kanji. But let's see who's going to play on the left hand side because it could be a kanji that plays in the centre. Um, because if Diaz is in poor form, don't think Arte, um, Pep doesn't know that. And he's going to account for that because he knows um, um, Havertz is a very intelligent player. He's going to know this as well and pick on Diaz intentionally because he knows he's strong. He's, uh, Havertz is very strong and yeah, aggressive. He's probably their best defender in the air, even if his, his, his numbers have dipped, as Doogie mentioned. So that will be a really interesting battle. Obviously, Diaz dropped against Liverpool. Klopp said that was more about needing pace against Nunez um, with a kanji. But in this instance, Diaz looks like the one who will be uh, asked to, to stock high habits. Mm. Yeah, because they, they will certainly... That's interesting. It got dropped because of the pace of Nunez. Now, Kajabas' pace is deceptively quick as well. Saka is quick. Martinelli is quick. The only way I can see our attacking force not being quick is, is Jesus plays or Chossard plays. That's slow down our play. But with Kai Havertz, he's deceptively hey, quick. Kai Havertz, a lot of respect. You mentioned the Champions League final. That ball flew <laughs> from Mason Mount. Kai Havertz on the end of it and, and scoring to give Chelsea uh, the Champions League trophy. But has, has the thought been of... There's, that, there's never any doubting that he's a very talented player, Kai Havertz. It's, it's where do you play him and what do you do with him? And has Mikel Arteta unlocked that conundrum. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I think he's in many ways the victim of his own versatility, as you say. He's played well for a number of in a number of Well, being a victim is a bit harsh because he says he'll love it. Now being a victim is a bit harsh. It's just he needs to now lock down a position for himself. Right? It's I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, honestly. Honestly. Um unless, until you starting to show that you're better in one position if you're not, if you're just averaging everything, then that's that's all the cookie crumble. But now it's down to you to improve in certain areas, improve in certain qualities for the manager to keep playing in certain areas. And that's what Kai Havertz has been doing. And that's why he's our number one striker. Positions over the years for Bar Leverkusen always a withdrawn 10, sometimes on the left or right of a 4 2 2 2. Uh, for Arsenal, he's played very well in that Xhaka role more recently, but it's really a centre forward where he's putting his best performances for Arsenal now. As he mentioned, pretty, every, pretty much every manager that he's played for, either at international level or at club level, has made him a key part of their side. He hasn't always delivered on a consistent basis, but it's great to see Kai Havertz, who was so maligned when he joined Arsenal, for huge money in the summer, really start to repay that transfer fee with only Saka scoring more league goals than him this season for us. Look at this. So we see that Kai Havertz is ready. You see that bicycle kick? Kai Havertz is ready, baby. He's ready for this match. Let's go. Let's go, Kai. So now we're going to take a listen to what Declan Rice has been saying and the potential match-off between him and Rodri. Because we heard him say that, listen, Rodri is one of the best sentiments in the world. Let's see the potential uh, fight that's about to unfold between these two top, top sentiments in the world. Well, it's under four different managers now, and all four of them have been completely different in, in their own ways. Um, you know, when I come to, to Arsenal, to Mikel, and obviously see the way he played and the way he wants to, you know, attack teams, um, the way he sees me playing in his team, um, you know, it was very different to what I'd been used to, so it took a lot of time to get used to that. See, I told you. This is what I say that, listen... When he just came, he looks like how uh, um, Jacker was better than Rice, but he said it himself the way he played at West Ham is totally different. 
And if you're supposed to judge Xhaka from when Arteta just took over, you realise that Xhaka took a lot more time to transfer that, his mindset to trans, um, transcend where he used to play and how he used to play, um, the position he used to pick up. The Xhaka that we played under, under recent Arteta is the Xhaka we thought we were signing when he came from um, Magalbak. Magalbak, I can't pronounce that name. Um, so this is it that... Rice now, he needed time to adapt. And he said it that period in, 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 in pre-season tour in America, he was so poor, especially against United. But now, when he fought, his foot is on the ground now, he's off and running. He's getting better and better. Each match is putting on top, top performances. And it's all due to um, confidence and time in the um, team. The more and more it's gone on, I've really, really enjoyed it. And you know, there's still so much more to come as well. I think he likes the fact that I can get around the pitch and... You know, disrupt play. Um, so when we're pressing teams high up, he likes being that more advanced role. And with the ball, you know, I've been playing in a complete different position. I've been playing in a pocket. Um, he's been telling me about arriving in the box, you know, body orientation, turning in pockets. You know, it's been complete. Oh my gosh, There's, that's a lot to unpack right now. Arriving late in the box, that was Xhaka at the end of his career at Arsenal. Arriving late in the box, that's Aaron Ramsey. So this is the type of player Arteta is trying to mould. Now, Xhaka can get back, Ramsey couldn't. So, um, and, and for me, Rice is a better defensive midfielder than Xhaka ever was or ever could be. And I see his potential to go attacking even better than Xhaka. So overall, right, and he's still young. So Rice for me is a top, top quality signing. So he's talking about the position himself in the box. Rice scored two headers, arriving late in the box, two headers, important headers for us as well. Arriving late in the box with his body position turning the right way. This is why he's got the power on the header. He's got nice power on it. So for me, Arteta is doing a splendid job with every single player in our club. Arteta is doing some good man-on-man, -man, one one-on-one management, and we can see the fruits right now. We're reaping the fruits of Arteta's labour in these players. And I'm the sixth role, so um, it's a lot to learn, but it's something that uh, I'm really enjoying because it's, you know, it's making me a better. This is the heat map, not quite as much detail in, in, in my screen as. Uh... Now, look at the difference now. With West Ham, there's no attacking, uh, um, attacking mid in, a, in an advanced position on the right hand side. It's on the left and the bottom. Now, look at Arsenal. It's like a butterfly, it's evenly covered. Now, this guy is playing most of the time left centre mid. Or right, no, most of the time left centre mid. Um, Jorginho is playing right. He's playing either sitting or he's playing right. No, either either he's sitting or he's playing left. Jorginho either sitting or playing right. And look at the butterfly. Look at that. Every single area you can see that on the left hand side attacking it's a bit low, but overall that's a balanced play. And now with West Ham it's only one side. It's one side. With Arsenal is everywhere. That's Ham. <laughs> you can see this is a comparison between West Ham in the Premier League last season compared to Arsenal. So immediately you can see at West Ham under David Moyes, yeah. Declan Rice was playing more as a, as a holding midfielder, didn't get into those advanced positions as much. And as you can see, as well, spent a lot of time out on that left hand side. So he would sort of pivot down the left hand channel. That was his role. But you can see how much he's evolved and changed under Mikel Arteta. He's the butterfly literally evolved <laughs> he evolved from a cocoon to a butterfly you can see it on the map <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> he evolved from a cocoon to the butterfly look the chart tells it from the box to the box to midfielder now not just playing as that holding midfielder but someone who can punch forward into those advanced areas he can create create things hang around the box as well win the ball high up the pitch his energy, his work rate, his enthusiasm to win the ball, that's what's key for Arsenal. And you can see that in those two heat maps. Very different. And uh, once again, people talk about 105 million being a loss of money for Declan Rice. Already you're starting to see that investment and yeah. why Mikel Arteta and Edu were so keen to get his signature and why Manchester City were also interested as well. But these heat maps give a real indication of what he brings to that pitch. And quite simply at Arsenal, he is everywhere. Guardiola and Mikel Arteta describe both of these midfielders as lighthouses, but it's not the only... Wow. Wow. Look at this. Look at the stats. Look at the stats. Six goals each, five assists each, shooting accuracy. 
get in rice. Rice wins on shooting accuracy by two points. Then passing accuracy. Roger wins by one point. Tackles Rice with so overall. Rice is the better midfielder this season. Overall, right? <laughs> Yo, I'm happy because. These United, I remember my mate United fan when we said Rice, oh Rice is rubbish, he's rubbish, he's gonna flop, he's gonna flop. He's done 105 million. I remember all these negative and I was defending. Even though I've never seen him play for Arsenal, I don't know how he's gonna play. I just trust my manager, I trust my sporting director, I trust my I trust everyone in the hierarchy of the club. Apart from the owners, even though I'm starting to get a develop a level of trust for the owners right now, but I trust everyone in my club right now, including the players. Is we signed because we altered them must sign him for a reason and now we see it look at this Roger is the best midfielder in the world according to some according to most look at this Rice going toe to toe and I believe won because he's got one over look Roger won and passing accuracy but well, tackles Declan Rice won shooting accuracy Declan Rice won so that's 2-1 to Declan Rice Comparison and similarities they have, as you can see, they go into this game on exactly the same amount of goals, same assists, and the shooting accuracy, passing accuracy, and tackles are very much the same as well. It's going to be a match of midfield this match. This match on Sunday is going to be the match in midfield. And I think that we might overcome that because of Giorgino's help and Partey's help. I think that we might edge it, but it's going to be down to that. And Odegaard as well. Yeah, I think it's going to be so down to that. So this is how they're similar, but they're actually quite different in terms of how they break the lines. And as you can see from these stats, Rodri is basically the pass master. He breaks the lines, defenders by... Well, this is where I think they're interested. Now, when you take a pass completed, Rodri is number one, right? Rice is now is ninth rank in the Premier League pass completion because Rice is not a passer. Rice is more of a carrier, um, and you can see that by his carries. Rice is number one. I don't want to. I don't want to jump the gun. Defenders by a pass by a pass is once again. Um, Rodri is, is number one because he's a passer in that City team, and that's why I've been saying that we need a passer in our team as well. Jorginho is that passer, and Partey is that passer, but sometimes Partey ain't fit, and um, so. Uh, George is that Georgino is the passer for our team, so don't watch that when Declan Rice is 15. He's not that's not what he does in our team. He's there to break up the play and carry the ball. That's why we see carries at uh, number one, while um, Rodri as is at number two. So Rodri is overall a better um, passer and carry when you take a look on both. He 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 is high up the food chain in 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 that um, um, offensive creative side of a midfielder. Because he can do both. He can pass and he can carry. While Rice is not a good passer from midfield, but he's a very good carrier off the ball. Uh, when you look at beating defenders by carry, he's number one again. And while Rodri is number four, which is not that bad. Number four in the Premier League is not that bad. You see that Rice um, best is six and ninth off if he's not number one. While Rodri is no higher than number four. So one to four is Rodri. That's very, very good overall. Final third entries, Rodri is number two. Rice is number six. So overall, Rodri won this by a clear, clear mile. Clear, clear margin. So, we could say that so far, overall, I think Rodri is edging it over Rice. Pass by passes. By basically. But then again, it's just passes, right? And no, final third entries. He's edging it on final third entries as well. So, Rodri is edging it by passes and the final third entries. Um, while Rice is edging it by carries. So yeah, that's 2-1 to Rodri, I would say, on this page. 2-1 to Rice on the other page. So overall, that's 3-3. Passing three. the ball and finding those gaps. Whereas Declan Rice, on the other hand, he's the best player in the Premier League at carrying the ball. And both players sort of enter the final third. Uh, well, Rodri does it a lot more, but that's because Rodri have... Uh, Man City have the ball a lot more. So you can see that... Actually, they're both very attacking threats as well. So while they're both coming up against each other in the midfield, they're actually going to have to stop each other in the penalty area as well. Yeah, this is a huge one, isn't it? Absolutely huge. Now, early... Well, remember, this is not a huge one. I don't know what he's on about. <laughs> you remember that clip last season when, when uh, Haaland tried to run like a robot? 
Try to barge into Silva. You see a guy on the floor like this is twist up his hand is all over, his neck is crook, he's looking like something from a scary movie. He got run over by William Silva. He crashed in William Silva and was third. It was worse off for it, right? So William Silva ended his career in that match. There's the stories that came out, the ghost of of what was it? The ghost of Manchester. <laughs> I remember that vividly. He was the ghost of Manchester Highland. He was non-existent in that match. Yeah, Saliba there with him. Nice. And hopefully, it's another solid performance from Saliba up against him. But Highland is going to come for uh, revenge because he's that. I think Highland is a very, very petty guy. I see him fighting, trying to fight, I start fight sometimes because they lose or they draw. He's a petty guy. So you know he's going to come trying to get payback. And Saliba is going to oh, obviously destroyed Arsenal, Arsenal in this game last season, didn't he? He set, set up the two goals for Kevin De Bruyne. He scored the fourth goal himself. But of course, William Saliba was not playing that day. He was injured. It was Rob Holding instead. So this will be a really interesting duel at the Etihad Stadium. And you have to say, looking at the Emirates game in October, Saliba had the better of it, didn't he? And that day, Erling Haaland did manage a single shot, let alone score a goal in the Community Shield as well. Lockdown. Saliba had him a lockdown, not even one Erling shot. Erling Haaland did manage a shot in that game. So Saliba does have a, a, something to fall back on there. You know, the Arsenal fans will remember that body check on, uh, on Haaland that, that went viral at the time of that game. He's had an excellent season, Saliba. A bit of criticism from, from Didier Deschamps, the France boss, this week. But for Arsenal, he's been absolutely superb. Uh, and his task will be to shackle Erling Haaland again. Of course, that's not an easy feat. Haaland is... is ha what you talking about, Wes? That's easy for Saliba. That's easy for the Rolls Royce. You get me? That's very easy. I don't know what he's on about. But really, truly, if Haaland come with revenge, it's not going to be I easy. Having another spectacular season, and Arsenal know how dangerous he can be. But I think they will be a lot more confident going into this game with Saliba fit and available for sure. It will be interesting, though. I mean, Saliba didn't necessarily put in his best performance against FC Porto in that second leg, which was a game of huge magnitude as well. I do think he's been pretty imperious, uh, as Nick correctly points out this year. He's been pretty much faultless, but that was... A... Yeah, to be fair, Saliba has been a bit shaky of recent, and I'll be saying that in my, in my match uh, my match roundups. I've been saying that in all the uh, matches that he played bad, I've been saying in the analysis that sometimes he just looks shaky, and Gabriel's the one that sometimes are, is covering for him. But hopefully, he'll turn up for this match. Everyone needs to turn up on fire for this match. It's kind of a little bit of shakiness. Erling Haaland is really interesting. More shots, more shots on target than this time last year. Higher expected goals per 90 than this time last year. But just underperforming his expected goals, just not being clinical enough in the moment for his first time since joining Borussia Dortmund. There's actually only three players in the Premier League, Calvert-Lewin, Nicholas Jackson and Bruno Fernandes that have underperformed their expected goals by more. Wow. You write off Erling Haaland as wow. Carroll, he still scored 18 league goals this, this year, but at this stage last season, he scored 28. So that has been a notable drop off. And if Man City don't win the title this year, his performances will come under scrutiny. Wow, 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 wow. So Sunday's match is going to be an absolutely magnificent match. Everyone is going to be pumping. It's going to be battles in defence, in attack, in midfield. But for me, the most important um, challenge or the most important duel, I would say, is in the midfield between Rodri and Rice. Because and it's about who can help Rodri. De Bruyne is going to come back, I believe. So he's going to be there to help Rodri. We've got Odegaard and we've got Jorginho. And, uh, and party so I believe that we're going to edge them just because of our midfield we've got very good wingers and I believe that Declan Rice is good enough to under Doku and on the left hand side I don't think if we start Kivio I don't see um, um, Foden getting around him so hopefully this will be a win for us I'm predicting a 2-1 win or a 3-1 win that's my prediction Arsenal obviously a 2-1 Arsenal win um if we play a more um, more measured game like we did at the Emirates, like we see like test, test, testing, testing, like like a tug of war. But if it was if it's free flowing, I think we'll be seeing three one. Honestly, that's my prediction. So that's the video, guys. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share. Let me know your thoughts and everything you just saw. Let me know your opinions in the comment box below. Catch you in the next one, guys. And let me know your prediction. I want to know each and every one of you's prediction. Leave your prediction in the comment box below. Whether it's negative or whether it's positive, I want to see them. Catch you in the next video, guys. Goodbye.